everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the Beyond Boundaries Conference, session nine. Really look forward to a, a fantastic session. I've got a, a really great panel here, and we're going to be talking about sustainable development goal three, health and well-being. And we've got researchers that are working on various products and services to improve the health of populations. And that's all well and good working on these um, products and services, but translation is a key issue. How do you get these great ideas, these concepts out of the laboratory into the real world? And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today because no matter what you do in your laboratory, if you really want to have impact, you have to have some translational research. And our view is that good translational research requires excellent partners. So what I've found with my research, I've been working on nanotechnology and pain therapeutics. And when we wanted to do translation, we had to find a partner. We found a partner, Verpax Pharmaceuticals, in the United States. We out licensed this to them and they're collaborating now with the NIH to develop this pain therapeutic. And we're gonna hear from our excellent panel members on their translational journeys. So sit tight, get ready to participate. We're gonna ask you members of the audience lots of questions as well. So right now I'm gonna to go to the panel and I'm gonna ask the panel to introduce their research and to introduce themselves. And I've got really a dream panel. So I'm gonna start off with Professor Patty Kostkova who is from UCL. And so, Patty, if you want to then introduce yourself and introduce your research, panel members have two minutes each to really get their point across. Go for it, Patty. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for such an amazing welcome, Ijeoma. So as you said, I am Patty Koskova. I'm a professor of digital health at UCL, and I'm the director of UCL Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies. As you can imagine, quite topical in 2020. However, my research in digital health has taken me all around the world. As you can see on the slide, I've been working in Nepal, in Africa, in South America. And I also have been very passionate about going just beyond the ivory tower research outcomes and seeing how my research could genuinely help people in those countries to improve their healthcare and deliver their healthcare as a professional. In this particular panel, I will dwell on one of my um, exciting projects called Gazda, which is gamified antimicrobial stewardship decision support app in Nigeria, which is award-winning app demonstrating a behavior change and improving prescription policy in surgeons in Nigeria. So I look forward to sharing my expertise with you here today. Thank you so much, Patty. I mean, an award-winning app that changes behavior is fantastic. When I see my grandchildren playing games, I'm thinking, this isn't going to change their behavior, but you've had a really great experience with your, with your gamification of, of this prescribing, which is fantastic. I'm now going to go over to Professor Delmira Fernandez-Reyes, also from UCL. And Delmira, to introduce your research to the audience. Thank you very much, Ayoma, everybody, for inviting me. I am Professor Domingo Fernandez Reyes from uh, UCL, as Ayoma say, and as also the adjunct professor of pediatrics at the University of Ibadan. And if you can see our, our work with uh, my, my main area and my colleagues' areas are, are focused on, on health, pediatrics, and child health in sub Saharan Africa or in low and middle income countries. And over a partnership of well over 12 years, we have been focusing and creating a partnership with Ibadan uh, in, in childhood malaria research. Um, and it's been, as you can see in that in the slide, but as you can see all over, uh, the, 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 health, the health topic uh, has left us to create a center for computational sciences for health and development, which we do many areas of research, as I must say, from the, from, from the basic science, interdisciplinary basic science to actually to, to, to to the, to the population side. So one of the, the things I want to, you have the website there and, and the links, you can see all the research we do there in the African Center for Computational Sciences. 
for health and development, and paid attention to our work on malaria in diagnostics and intractable epilepsy, which are our uh, basically golden projects at the moment, um, mostly focuses in, in childhood health. And I'm really hopeful to get your input and give you our input on how to set uh, long-standing partnerships in the region. Thank you very much, Del Miro. I'm um, really interested in hearing about more, hearing more about the malarial research as we as we progress through the morning. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move to Olubaya Adekambi. And um, Bayo Adekambi is from MTN Nigeria. So Bayo, tell us a little bit about some of the research that MTN is doing. That's really exciting. We're really pleased to have you dialing in from Nigeria. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a good pleasure to join you this morning. Uh, like you said, MTN is a telecoms operator, uh, the biggest in Africa. Uh, so what we've been doing is largely enabling high impact research around uh, development goals, uh, leveraging our asset and expertise in the area of data science, big data, deep learning and telecom solution deployment. So essentially we supported work in the area of malaria uh, using mobility data of individuals around the country to understand patterns in malaria, uh, poverty and economic model, which are directly linked to health outcomes. And of course, we've done a lot around COVID-19 uh, epidemiological tracking, infectious diseases pattern using mobility data. And of course, a lot of work are also being done around health technology. How do we miniaturize uh, you know, the deployment of health solution using applications, telecoms platform, solution deployment that makes it very, very easy to collect data, deploy data, interpret you know, data outcome from health, and of course, uh, make a lot of difference in society. So I look forward to a great time today. Uh, I've been working, we've been working a lot uh, with Professor Delmiro, and we look forward to more partnership, uh, you know, uh, in leveraging telecoms data to make a lot of difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bio. It's really nice to see that you're actually using big data to make a difference. And, and it's quite, I, I mean, I remember you telling us about the work you were doing on COVID-19 and trying to understand where clusters were. And this is, it's it really, I'm really pleased to hear about this research and I hope to hear more as we, as we go along in the morning. So thanks a lot for that. The next um, uh, person that I'm going to introduce is Professor Quan Leong from UCL, who's going to tell us a little bit about the research in her laboratory and, and how uh, translational that, that kind of research is. So Quan Leong, over to you. Lovely. Uh, good morning, Ijoma and everyone. And uh, I'm uh, Professor Quan Leong Choi and the director of UCL Institute for Material Discovery. The research in my group focus on um, materials design, discovery of new materials and development of eco-friendly and sustainable coating manufacturing methods for energy, environment, healthcare and biomedical applications. So the research, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on fundamental research as well as material translation from laboratory towards real world applications. And for today's theme on healthcare and uh, biomedical related research. These include uh, the development of efficient dialyzer to transform dialysis of patients with kidney failure, as well as the low cost, high performance biosensor for monitoring uh, electrolytes imbalance in patient. And most recently I embark on the development of rapid biosensors for the detections of SARS-CoV-2 virus in partnership with uh, UCL Center for Clinical Microbiology and Royal Free Hospital, applying knowledge from science and clinical trial to address some, some of the pressing and challenging um, uh, recurrent medical needs. And our institute also have a global engagement partnership with um, PKU China, with University uh, in South Africa, as well as uh, Rome Tobagata, with Professor Aduni and Professor Ma Ma Masconi, uh, Professor Aduni also is a panelist here. So today I look forward to a very close of um, interactions with everyone and, uh, and see how we can, uh, as Ijoma said, how we can uh, take uh, lab-based uh, research outcome, fantastic result into the real world translation and make the impact. 
So uh, it's exciting opportunity to exchange ideas and uh, look forward to this uh, exciting session today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that's really, really cool, Quang Leong, to hear about your sensor work. And your sensor work, you've talked about the health applications, but also has wider applications in other areas as well. So that's yes. really, really interesting. And, and, and of course, um, we definitely need more dialysis uh, sort of um, capability on the African continent in the different African states. So look forward to, to seeing how, how, how close that can become to being a, a, a product. Thanks very much, Quan Leong. And uh, now I'm going to talk Thank to you. one of your collaborators, actually, which is really nice. And so Professor Fabiana Arduni is, is on the call. And uh, Fabiana, do you want to tell us a little bit about the kind of research that you're doing, please? Yeah. yeah. So thank you. I would like to thank for the invitation. Also, thanks to Professor Choi, uh, because we started the collaboration with UCL, uh, starting the collaboration with Professor Choi. Uh, our activity is based on the development of uh, electrochemical sensor, sensor and biosensor. With, with, when I explain about this sensor, I usually um, I give the example of a little sensor that each day the diabetic patients use for the detection of glucose. This strip is electrochemical sensor, and usually we produce in our lab this sensor in the, using different nanomaterial, different substrate for application in different field, starting for, for example, from environmental, so for detection of pollutants, uh, through also for the security for detection of chemical warfare agents, and also in biomedical field, in order to develop a smart point of care. Regarding the sensor, when I started to work in the sustainability vision, this sensor is, uh, uh, um, include the, oh, a lot of future regarding the sustainability. Why? Because uh, are cost effective, usually the ship is uh, um, cheaper than the uh, reference method. In addition, uh, this measure can be carried out at home not to, to go in the hospital, so decrease also the, uh, the moving in, in, uh, in the city. In addition, uh, we uh, were able to carry out the measure using a few uh, microliters of the sample. This means that also regard the low volume of the reagents. So we, uh, have, we can have um, uh, uh, less impact in order to produce of waste, but also to requirement of chemicals. So this sensor can be usually uh, seen like a sustainable analytical tools for application in different fields. Thank you very much, Fabiana. I like the way you talk about just reducing the volume will reduce yeah. the footprint, but it also probably reduces the cost as yeah, well if you reduce the volume. So this, yeah, is, yeah, exactly. this is, yeah, because there's, it's great if you have fantastic technology, but if the cost is outside of what most people can afford, then it remains on the shelf or just, just for, for people that have a lot of resources. So that's really lovely to hear that you, you focused on sustainability right from the design stage, which is not what we tend to do. We tend to add it on at the end. So that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matale Nkonde. And Matale, you're, you're joining us from New York. All we can yeah. say is thank you so much for giving up your sleep to join us. It's, it's fabulous. And, and I'd love to hear about what your company's doing. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Ajoba. So um, good morning, everybody. It's very early morning here in New York City. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of a nonprofit called AI for the People. And what we do is conduct um, digital ethnographic research uh, into areas. Specifically this year, we've been doing a lot around COVID. And what, we, what we're really interested in is assessing the privacy and human rights implications of those technologies, and then creating communications uh, products. So it could be film, it could be television, it could be public service announcement. And then we use that to influence policy, whether it's uh, policy on the federal level, we were involved in the introduction of the No Biometric Barriers to Housing Act, for example, which was looking at the way facial recognition and other technologies were impacting the way uh, black and brown communities live because we do have a racial justice and racial equity lens onto our work. And we've been more recently looking at COVID tracking technologies and what that means 
for uh, traditionally over surveilled, uh, over surveilled populations with an eye of making sure that medical data is kept as private as possible. So auditing apps also, and it's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful, Matale. I mean, this is, this is definitely what's needed because when you think about it, the artificial intelligence tools that use imaging do tend to make sure that certain people ultimately become disenfranchised. So we thank God that someone's looking at this actually. Well done, thank you so much, it's brilliant. And um, now I'm going to ask um, another person to, to speak, and that's Professor Ika Olua Lagunju, who's joining us from, uh, from Ibadan, actually. And um, it, it's really lovely to have you, Ike. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the work that you're doing. Thank Fabulous you. that you can join us from Ibadan. Thank you very much, Ijoma, and um, hello, everybody. Really nice to be here. Uh, my name is Ikela Gunju. I'm a professor of uh, pediatrics. I work at the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, and I'm also a consultant child neurologist at the UCH Ibadan. Uh, my research work in the last two decades thereabout has focused on um, pediatric neurology, which is my subspecialty area, and I've worked mainly on epilepsies and uh, stroke prevention in sickle cell disease. Uh, my collaborator is here, one of my major collaborators, Del Miro. Uh, so work with other partners at the UCL and a few others around the globe. And it's exciting, really. And I would say that the work has uh, actually led to improving the uh, care of children with epilepsies and stroke uh, in sickle cell disease in Nigeria, and I say possibly in Africa. And interestingly, one of the outputs of our research has been uh, reflected in the 2020 guidelines of the American Society of Hematology, which now stipulates that um, children in resource poor countries can have hydroxyurea rather than chronic transfusions for primary stroke prevention, you know, because in Africa there's no blood. So we had to work, you know, assiduously to find options for our children, and that's been very successful. And uh, more recently, our collaborations with partners at the UCL have engaged in cutting edge research uh, to improve the effectiveness of low field MRI, uh, which is the type of MRI machine that is readily accessible in the third world countries. But this machine is really limited in identifying structural brain lesions. So the technique, it's novel, is image quality transfer. Uh, the work is ongoing and the project aims to pioneer software solutions that enable low power, but cheap and sustainable imaging devices, which can provide a point of uh, care image data in resource poor countries. So we hope that with our work on uh, image quality transfer, we will be able to uh, give access, cheap access to good imaging facilities for good diagnosis, effective diagnosis and uh, uh, better decision making and uh, improved outcomes for children with epilepsy in Nigeria. Thank you. Oh, Ike, thanks so much. It's lovely to hear about research that's actually having an impact at the moment. So the alternative to the blood transfusion work is that's that's really impactful because as you, you're right, there isn't a, a sophisticated blood transfusion service. So finding an alternative, you're actually saving lives as the research is going on in the laboratory. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us as well. And um, we look forward to exploring more of your research as we go on uh, through the morning. It's brilliant. And now I'm going to go to Professor Adesoji Ademuyiwa. Um, so Soji is joining us on the telephone and um, I'm gonna ask uh, Soji to, to talk a little bit about the research that you're involved in. I know you've been working very closely with Patty Kotsova. So tell us a little bit about the work that you're involved in, Soji. Um, thank you very much, Ijeoma. My name is Adi Soji Adeoma. I'm a professor of pediatric surgery at the University of Lagos. And I'm also the chief of pediatric surgery at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Um, in the past 15 years, I've been involved in pediatric surgery. And in the last five years or so, I've been more actively involved in global surgery. So I've been involved in several collaborations including the one that I'm going to talk about today, which is the work we're doing together with Patty, the University College London. And um, it's about the GATSA, which is um, gamified antimicrobial stewardship support decision app. 
Um, what we know is that as surgeons, uh, there are two ways in which infection could occur. Um, first is that as surgeons, you could help to treat infections such as polycystitis or appendicitis. The other way is that as a result of the wound itself, there could also be infection from outside leading to surgical site infection. Now, this necessitates the use of antibiotics at one time or the other. Now, we know that antibiotic um, or antimicrobial resistance um, could lead to up to 10 million deaths, it's been estimated by 2050, and um, could also cost up to 66 trillion pounds. Now, this um, collaboration we are working on is aimed at helping surgeons to be able to um, strictly adhere to antibiotic stewardship and avoid the consequence of antibiotic um, resistance. And what happened was that um, with um, Patty and, his, and our team, we had several um, focus group discussions and developed an app um, which with, with its use, we were able to make sure that surgeons adhere to correct indication dose and usage of antibiotics to prevent antibiotic um, resistance. And this is the GATSA app, um, which is what has brought me and got um, party together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soji. I mean, it, it, it's great to also hear from someone that actually used the app uh, as well. It, and, and in your view, you, you actually found, did you find that the hospital used less antibiotics when the app was introduced? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, there were two things that the app did. First, it ensured that people use the antibiotics only when it is indicated. They use the correct dose, the correct type of antibiotics for the correct type of wound. And then the second thing is that it improved the surgeon's confidence. So surgeons became more confident to say that, look, I am treating this patient based on WHO guidelines or other guidelines that are internationally accepted and I know that what I'm doing for this patient is what will have been done anywhere in the world and the patient is getting the right treatment. So it's been very, very helpful and the surgeon's um, response has been incredible. Brilliant, thank you so much. So now we're just moving on now to explore all the themes. And, and the first thing we're going to explore is, you know, how people find their partners and how they co-create research with their partners. So. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the audience to get involved. So audience, now is your chance to get involved. There are various polls that you're going to participate in. So the questions are coming up and I'm going to read them out. How did you meet your translational partners? So this is a question for the audience. How did you meet your translational partners? And you have a variety of options that you can, you can tick. So that's the first question. Tell us how you met your translational partners. The second question for the audience, and that will come up soon, is use one word to describe the translational area you're working in. We want to understand which area that people tend to gravitate to. And then the um, other thing that we want to ask is, is quite clearly, we want to know what collaborative ideas you're currently working on. And again, you can work that, that way with the word cloud. So you've got three questions for the audience. How did you meet your translational partners? Use one word to describe the translation area you're working on and tell us about your collaborative ideas. So, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the audience and I'm gonna talk, a little, uh, sorry, go to the panelists and ask them some questions. So my first question is for you, Del Miro, and, uh, and, and Ike, and, and really to, to tell us about the research outputs that you co-created with your partners. Delmira, you can just give us one and tell us really about how the um, co-creation worked. Hi, thanks. Uh, um, well, to give you an example, uh, I have been extremely lucky to be able to, to work with an uh, interdisciplinary group of scientists and, and, and academics in, in Nigeria in the University of Nevada specifically. And all since 15 years onwards, I think everything that we have done together there has been co-created from the beginning. And mostly because we are a challenge-driven approach. So we sit on, 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 a, on, on what it needs to be solved. And then we put all our science and disciplines together to solve it. So the best example I will give you is malaria. 
So when we started at the beginning working on very sophisticated um, uh, pathogenesis study to understand why some children develop some severe complications, and what we unravel those those kind of uh, very very minute differences, we then move in most to the translational with with basically, for example, diagnosis is still a big problem, and other areas of malaria itself is still a big problem. For example, we don't have uh, methodologies to, 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 to assess the burden of the disease that manage uh, to allow manage the hospital, the resources, et cetera. So all what we've been done with our partners, and, 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 and they are more than partners, actually, because I became actually an a academic inside the partner institution, uh, is being always uh, that, uh, on, that, on that kind of path. I think I, um, AK can expand a bit on that as well. Mm, brilliant. So, so what you're saying is that, you know, for the malaria research, you had to be in the thick of the malaria zone and you had to work with malaria experts in yes. order to, yes. to lift that off the page. So Ike, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you co-created the research that you described with your partners. It could be another example as well. So we have a variety. Thank you, Ijoma. Uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, just like Delmiro said, uh, the research outputs were largely born out of needs and common interests, you know, we consider the areas that would have a major impact on child health and uh, we recognized opportunities when they arose and we decided to focus on key diseases of public health importance and those that uh, currently make significant contributions to morbidity and mortality. And as Demiro has talked about uh, malaria, the other one is epilepsy, you know, for example, epilepsy is the leading neurological disorder worldwide uh, it's currently estimated that about 50 million people living with epilepsy and uh, all over the world, two thirds of them are children and majority live in the developing countries. You know, So we decided that, I mean, we need to find a solution. We need to contribute you know, in one way to improve the diagnosis. We realized that many children with epilepsy in Nigeria have uh, quite about 20% oh, of them have intractable epilepsies Oh, we seem to have lost Ike. Lost yes, Ike, you, you seem to froze. But I can't, one thing. Oh. Okay, yes, oh, now you're right back. back. You're back. Yeah, you're back. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Well, I was talking about our work on epilepsy and trying to say that, you know, epilepsy has a huge body. We have like 50 million people living with epilepsy and majority are in the developing countries, two thirds of them are children. And a major problem with epilepsy is the, with those with intractable seizures and uh, many of them have structural brain lesions that are not diagnosed because of the low field MRI. So we decided we had an opportune meeting, Delmiro uh, and I, Alexander, Daniel Alexander, and then we thought about it. How can we, you know, bridge this together, basic science and pediatric neurology? And then we had this idea to work from the laboratories to develop a software that can readily you know, be uh, applied in the, low, in the developing countries on the low field MRI scans to improve their effectiveness in identifying lesions. And I say this has been uh, quite exciting. So uh, we're in the midst of the project, but we believe that ultimately we have a software that will pioneer solutions. It's low cost, you can put... Okay, we'll have to move on to... We'll have, we'll have, thank you, Ike. We'll have to move on and ask, um, I, I want to come to you, uh, Lubaya Dekombi, and, and ask you, you, you're sitting on a rich data set, um, a data set which no, it's not available to academics. And so talk us through how you've been able to leverage that data set with your partners and, and have an impact. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think for us, uh, knowing that, uh, we understand the mobility of people, our people cluster, and the behavioral or geodemographic profile of those cluster can provide relevant insight that can support social intervention, especially around the SDGs. Uh, we put together a research team, which I lead under our Innovation and Transformation Office, uh, to look for partners who really want to make sense of those data. And that explains our partnership with UCL through Professor Demuro around using big data mobility because people cluster together and to a large extent, people are very, very predictable in terms of who they stay with, how often they move around 
and how you can also understand where they are based on what we call point of interest analysis. So essentially, we did a lot of work around COVID-19, around three major uh, breakthroughs. Uh, first is around uh, the national needs analysis, where we try to predict resource requirement by state in Nigeria in terms of understanding the likely, uh, you know, just to support preparedness via pro proactive resource allocation. And then we did a lot around capacity assessment uh, to you know, work with all the 36 states in Nigeria uh, to manage the pandemic based on the estimated risk of uh, COVID transmission using population metrics, international travel, uh, population density, state contiguity, and of course, bringing in epidemiological metrics from medical perspective to estimate number of vulnerable people per state, and of course, guide government on needs assessment in terms of what is required uh, to proactively prepare for all the possible needs and exposure. Uh, so for us at MTN Nigeria, is all about integrating data that gives us insight on contextual social dynamics, uh, population density, contiguity, access to support, areas where there might be disproportionate health facility and help might be needed uh, so that we can triangulate all the various socioeconomic profile and geospatial data to guide researchers on what to look out for and how to proactively address those problems. So at MTN Nigeria, we see ourselves primarily as an enabler that is always available to make it anonymized, the identified and aggregated data together, such that privacy of our customers are respected. And those data can be used by medical experts to gain insight on those social dynamics that can appropriately help health outcomes and interventions as appropriate. Uh, so we, we are always very open. In addition to use of big data is solution development. We are very, very keen on how our applications and platform can also be used in building solutions uh, that can support health outcomes in any area of interest. Uh, so we look forward to more partnership and do much more with UCL and beyond anyone that is interested in making sense of big data in, you know, make, you know, in working on georeferencing, socioeconomic profiling, geospatial, uh, community clustering, vulnerability, and of course, uh, poverty indicators that have consequence on health outcomes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bart. I mean, it's clear that you can do quite a lot with mobile phone data. It's, it's very, very clear. I like the, I think we're going to explore how you identify vulnerabilities from this data, but, but uh, we'll explore that as we keep going. I'm going to now turn to you, um, Mutale, and, and, you know, the work that you described earlier about, you know, really using artificial intelligence to, to aid things like access to housing and things like that. And tell us how you built your partnerships. How did that work across a partnership? So we, most of our partnerships come from conferences and papers. So we're very, uh, we're very, very aggressive in both academic publishing as well as general publishing. And uh, we have really encouraged our folks to do fellowships. I did one at Harvard last year, I'm at Notre Dame. Uh, this year, Stanford and others so that we have built in university partners. And then we will look for a global a, a global organization to get the word out. So one of our current partnerships is with Amnesty International and using their research, but more importantly, their brand, making sure that when we think about um, human rights and when we think about the SDGs, we are also thinking about black humans and anti-black racism and how it shows up uh, the differential impact on those communities that are racialized as black. And that can be of African descent, but we're also finding that populations like the Dalit in India, for example, or the Yega in China are also treated in comparable ways. And once, because we have these larger, uh, larger partnerships, Amnesty, Move On and others, we can then go to the Hollywood community and pitch films and get them on places like Netflix. We can then, we, we're activating a partnership with the city of New York around COVID tracking, right? And making sure that that data isn't shared with our police forces. We can, um, which, is a, which is a massive uh, issue for us. 
And then we can also look, and this is why we're so excited to be here. We're also really interested in how those meanings of race, racism, and technology and technological development translate into other contexts. So would a campaign that we activate in New York City look the same in New Delhi, look the same in London, look the same in Lagos? And so we have to then, um, we would then have to look for in-country partnerships. Uh, just like our, our colleagues that spoke earlier about malaria, we believe that the true expert is the expert that's impacted. And then we can bring, I know we're going to speak about funding and others, but we can bring resourcing to those questions and make sure that as the technology is developed, we're also thinking about the real impact on the most vulnerable groups. Brilliant. I mean, I, I love that your, your partnerships are rich and varied. I mean, from Hollywood to Amnesty International, I mean, you know, they, they, they rarely get in bed together. So the fact that you're talking to both bodies also gives you a lot of um, um, in, in intelligence that's not available to other organizations, which I think is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm now going to ask, um, listen to some audience questions. Just, and so, um, Funny, can you give us some questions from the audience for the panel, please? Hey, Gemma, we've got a few questions from the audience. I'll read the first two. One is for Mutare, and it said, it, someone asked, could you please share more on how, how one inquires into being a UN advisor on race and AI? The second question is to the panelists. How do the panelists balance focus on translational research versus pure research, both are enablers in some shape or form? How is success measured and rewarded? Thank you very much. So Mutale, if you want to quickly um, just tell uh, the, the audience member how to become an advisor, and then I'll, I'll move on and I'll ask um, Quan Leong to address the other question. Uh, go to conferences, go to conferences and, and get on panels. That was my, my journey there. And then just having quite this unique niche where the Human Rights Council were not necessarily looking at um, anti-Black racism and the human rights impact there was how I think I probably wiggled my way into that room. Thank you very much, Matale. And Quan Leung, do you want to talk about how to balance one's research, basic versus translational? Yes, uh, yes, uh, happy to uh, answer this question. Of course, uh, other colleagues uh, and the panelists have uh, um, other sort of uh, ideas. Feel free to chip in. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is a, is a very good question. And uh, one would need to find the fine balance. And quite often that um, for any translational research, because um, uh, to be able to be financed and funded, uh, to really take it uh, towards real world applications, you find that towards higher technology uh, readiness level. And, and that's quite often you need to have a patent protection in order for any uh, sort of um, uh, organizations or tech fund to take the risk uh, to uh, take this further down up the stream. So um, so it's quite, um, you know, how one could balance these uh, peer review publications as well as translations. One of the best way is that once you identify that, you know, your, your research is unique, novel, and could make an impact. So earlier on, please engage with your um, uh, business uh, partner within your organizations or your university quite often they be able to advise you and they could uh, um, work with you and um, and take the technology a bit uh, mature that you can file a patent protections. Once you have uh, filed your patent protection, then please feel free, then you can then proceed with your um, journal publications. So therefore you can maintain the best of the both world. So uh, for, for instance, in the most recent case, uh, this Nobel uh, winner on this CRISPR, the, the lady, um, the, the two inventors, and they have, um, you know, they have been um, multi-millionaire at the same time. Uh, they also have a very uh, Nobel Prize, so you can have it all, you know, if you uh, plan it right. And also, uh, before you publish, it's important you get your IP, intellectual property, to be protected. Therefore, then, uh, followed by publications, and then, um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, this is uh, helpful, yeah. Thank you very much, Quang Leong. I, I need to focus on my planning so that I can become a multimillionaire and a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> I'm really focused very heavily on that. And uh, wh while I'm focusing, I'm going to ask Patty 
and Soji to tell us a little bit about your partnership, Patty and Soji. We've got about a minute and a half. So Patty, if you go first. Thank you so much, um, Ijeoma. Really exciting discussions. And I think it kind of boils down to the fundamental problem. We have to go beyond just wanting to publish an impact factor journal papers. We really have to create equitable partnerships with partners like Soji in Nigeria, who are working together with us and we jointly produce some innovation or impactful research, which then having the ownership of the local partners have got the potential to change prescription practices or contribute to any other big health problems globally. What do you think, Soji? What's your take on it? You're um, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, definitely it's important that um, one of the things about this particular partnership with the party was the fact that we were involved right from the beginning. And I think that's very, very important because that um, encouraged the buy-in of surgeons. Um, permit me to say many people perceive surgeons as being um, aloof and probably um, self-oriented, um, but it's not exactly so. Um, but the issue was right from the beginning, we were involved and we involved everybody across the CADA. So we involved very senior consultants, junior consultants and trainees as well of, of different, uh, different experience. And um, it's interesting to be in that room, you know, people talking and telling us what needs to be involved in the app so, such that by the time the app was produced, it was almost like we own it. And this is across the three centers um, which were involved, not only in Lagos, we also had um, Lagos University Teaching Hospital, as well as um, a, another hospital in Niger Delta University. Um, so I think it's important to involve partners right from the beginning to have their buy-in. And I think that's an essential thing I learned from this partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Soji. That, that's, I, I love the way you, you sound as if you, 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 you really, um, you, you own, own, the, own the app, which I think is, Fantastic, it, 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 it really is brilliant. I'm gonna now just go to Professor Fabiana Argini to, to give, just give us one minute now to sort of tell us how you met your partner and, and how you forged your partnership. Fabiana. Yeah, thanks. Allora, I'll say the, um, also before uh, the conference it can be very uh, crucial point, uh, the connection with other researchers, especially because when uh, some, someone make a presentation, show the results, and the audience can understand how, uh, regarding the topic, uh, um, we can start a collaboration. This is one point. Other point, uh, something um, often happens also that uh, I can receive an email because the other are reading the, the paper, and uh, we can start a collaboration also in this, in this line. And recently, also by LinkedIn. Sometimes I receive some message and start the chat and share the idea and start the collaboration. Then my last review is started on LinkedIn message. Okay, brilliant. So many different ways. Now let's let's look about the see what the audience has, has been telling us um, to the polls. So how did you meet your translational partners? And um, you can see the results of the poll. Most people met their translational partners by an introduction by a colleague. And in this lockdown world, I ask you panelists, how are we gonna meet people? How are we gonna be introduced by a colleague? I just hope that what we're gonna take from this is that we all have our contacts. I've introduced you all, so you all know each other and hopefully you'll work together. But that's what people are saying. They met as introduction by a colleague, but some people, as Fabiana said, found each other in LinkedIn, met each other at conferences. How are you gonna meet someone in a virtual conference? The only way is if you have this kind of conference here. And the next question that we ask the audience is to use one word to describe the translational area they're working on. And let's see what, and so we, we've got quite a lot happening here, quite a lot with mental health, um, economics, infections. So a variety of different responses to that question. It, it doesn't look as if chemical and materials tea not quite sure what, what that means, probably it's material science. But as you can see, people are working on a variety of things and integrity, that's a good one. 
uh, for health and well-being. Uh, we have to think about that a little bit more. Um, what collaborative ideas are you currently working on is what we asked the audience. And let's see what the audience said in response to that. And public engagement, they're looking at, oh, materials for defense and healthcare, how to prevent things and community-based mental health. So mental health is, it seems to be quite a big one when it comes to translational area and what people are working on. I'm now gonna move on over to in two and really talk about the challenges. At the moment, we have a fantastic panel and they're talking about the success, the success when it comes to working with partners. But we all know that there are challenges when it comes to building cross-border partnerships. Um, one of my biggest challenges with my cross-border partnership in the US is when they have meetings at nighttime. Nighttime for me, daytime for them. It's a big challenge for me because I like my sleep. But anyway, I try and overcome this by uh, staying up late. That's a huge challenge. And of course, we've got the challenge of money. So first questions are to the audience. And those are, how easy is it to work across disciplines and across borders? Because normally when you're looking for a partner, you are looking for a partner that has complementary skills. So you first of all have to overcome the fact that you have to speak your partner's language and then your partner is in a different place as well. So that's the first question. The second question to the audience is to use one word to describe how uh, the research problems that, that come up when you have these cross-border partnerships. And then the last question, do you think remote working was gonna make this whole, a whole lot easier? The fact that we're all virtual now, doesn't mean we're gonna have more partnerships. Is, it gonna, is life gonna become easier? I, I think I know the answer to that, but let's see what the audience thinks. Now to the panelists. And, and really it's about describing the challenges associated with, uh, with, uh, with, your, with your partnerships. And Fabiana, I'm actually gonna to go to you first and, and to ask you to give us an example of a challenge when it came to working with a partner. Okay, so uh, I like this, uh, this question because especially biosensory is a very multidisciplinary area. So uh, start this field from since, uh, 20, 30 years ago, and uh, start in this direction to be um, a field in which different uh, disciplines can work together. Because uh, for the drop of biosensor, we need our biological um, uh, skills to develop the uh, bio component. We have uh, the skill of material, nanomaterial, to the modify, the, for example, the sensor to improve the sensitivity, so the analytical performance. We need to do electronic uh, to transform the signal to the, the biochemical signal to electrochemical signal. So this is a, a multifarious uh, uh, discipline. So of course, uh, at the start, it's not so easy and, uh, to work together because uh, different scientists use uh, sometimes different words also to explain the same concept. So at the start, it's not so easy, but uh, when uh, we can go this uh, uh, wall, uh, we can um, develop a useful tool, especially we can merge the skill in order to, uh, in addition, have an um, improvement idea. Because uh, if you work uh, in the same line uh, with the same uh, type of sciences, for example, I'm an analytical chemist, you see only this, this line. If you uh, merge different skill with different scientists, we have uh, a lot of idea in mind that we can exploit the, the other skill also in uh, our own field, so. Brilliant, I think that's excellent. I mean, you, you, you summed it up. You've got a language difficulty, first of all. Yeah, yeah. Look, Mutale, I'm asking the same question to you. You've got, your partners are the most varied I've ever heard of because you really are working across sectors. Give us an example of some of the challenges. I mean, I'm sure you've overcome them, but give us a flavor. Uh, massive challenges. So often when we're taking an idea from concept, I found that working, being US-based, and often that's where our funding is coming from, that we tend to kind of have this very imperialist view of the project in terms of how we're going to shape narratives. That's a massive amount of what we do in terms of health and um, healthcare technology. And really, really, um, really making the pitch that value lives in the global South is has been a massive 
challenge for me. So there is a project that we're teeing up right now and our regions are the US, India, uh, China, and uh, the Middle East. And just having a conversation about Sub-Saharan Africa as somebody who's Zambian to not only include you know, one of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but then do that type of co-creation work that was described before with the surgeons being in right at the beginning. And that's something that I'm still negotiating. And then when we're working with academics who have different standards of evidence, versus general audiences, because we're really interested in policy, whether it's governmental, multinational, or even platforms. So, you know, one of the questions we've asked ourselves this year has been around health disinformation in the United States. And, are, you know, are masks political or are they masks, right? And we wanted to intervene to make sure that the public health message was heard. And that results, that was speaking to platforms and what platforms requires evidence looks very different to what our academic partners mm. um, thought of as evidence. And it sometimes felt, you know, as the tran translator, I'm a journalist by training and worked for the BBC for years uh, before do being in this role, you know, as the communicator that's in the middle, I want to shout at both of them because what we need is impact. I just want people to wear masks. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and um, another thing that I'll say, we found very challenging kind of thing in the communication space has been, has been like academic protocols around citation and making sure that people are credited for their work because that is valuable for them in the academy. But mm -hmm. in multidisciplinary teams where we really are thinking about ourselves as almost like a you know a rugby team where we're all together and we're all running for the ball mm -hmm. has has that that creation of new norms and so I would say that even though we're in the translation business our biggest audiences are actually our stakeholder partners to make mm -hmm. sure that we, we meet got we meet everybody's needs yeah that, that's that's really fascinating I mean the issue of having this imperialist view is something is a perception that has to be changed and totally agree right. with bio let's let's come to you now and and talk about you know, you've got this rich data set you can do a myriad of things with it what are the challenges when it comes to talking to academics who and, and i'm sure everybody wants your data and you you just have to choose <laughs> tell us a little uh, bit about that yeah, th thank you very much. Um, you know, the, the, as you said, and I think I also defer to a lot of things that Mutali said, uh, this is about customer data. So there's a lot of privacy issue. So which means that there must be due respect for extant laws, uh, issue of GDPR, and even the national uh, data law that we have in my country, Nigeria. So those indicators are there. Uh, so it's always important that those data are highly aggregated highly anonymized and de-identified. And most of the time, that is where the first problem with the academic community comes. They want to have everything. <laughs> and of course, uh, it's always a back and forth in terms of, oh, I need the data, I need to know their age, I need to know their gender and all. But of course, we cannot provide all those data uh, because at all time, uh, the rule is very clear. Uh, the privacy of the customers must be respected and they must understand the fact that their data is being used uh, in any way. And I think we do that in traditional research where uh, for you know, health-related research, there's always a deliberate effort to get uh, the individual to be fully aware of the consequences of the response that they are providing and how those responses are being used. So I think there's always a mismatch of expectation. And this is very consistent where you know, there's a project. You know, and of course, there's also institutional uh, governance protocol that maybe bureaucratic on both sides. You know, for example, there is a project we are working on with UCL through uh, Professor Demiro, and we need to get some data. And of course, our internal process had extended it because during the period, we got a new law from the government around what kind of data can be provided. So it's a shifting goalpost all the time. Why? Because it also has to do with national security. And all this must be respected. So there must be flexibility in terms of expectation on the part of the academic community to also understand that institution has statutory role to, to fulfill. So it may not be able to meet all the expectation. 
The second has to also do with the fact that businesses are businesses. We are meant to make money. Uh, when, you know, so, uh, so most of the time when there's a lot of pressure on us uh, for data, we must remember that we are a going concern whose existence is premised on profitability, which means that we are running business every day. So we may not have a dedicated resource looking for data for academic community. They are primarily recruited to help the business make decisions for profitability. So just mismark. But I think uh, we, we've, we've scaled a lot working with Professor Del Miro. Uh, there's been a lot of understanding and mutual uh, in understanding around the gaps, what is possible, what is not possible. When the two partners are aligned on expectation and there's flexibility, of course, we can get a lot done. And that's what I've learned uh, working with UCL, particularly Professor Del Mio. Brilliant. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Businesses are there to make money. So hopefully you can have a match where the, the, uh, the research that's being done also helps your profitability. I'm going to ask the audience to remember to ask our esteemed panelists questions. I mean, don't let them just get away with um, answers that you, you're not happy with. You want to test them so that you get some, some real truth today. So please ask your question. Um, the next person I'm going to ask, I'm going to come to you, Quang Leong, and tell us a little bit about the challenges when you were developing your census, your, your, um, your census, some of the challenges that you, you uh, encountered. Yes, uh, you find that uh, for the census, uh, I mean, for example, for a case like we want to use it for the uh, the COVID-19, um, the, for the detections of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, quite often is that uh, we can do certain tests up to certain uh, steps, you know, like using the antigen. However, if you want to use the live virus, so therefore one would require the certified sort of a, um, laboratory um, that is a biosafety lab level three, which is certified, which will be costly. So uh, in the initial, when we uh, try to do this sort of a proof of concept, that is a real challenge. And therefore it's chicken and egg issues. Uh, it's not some quite, uh, depends, there are certain biosensors project like Professor Fabiana, that is quite easy, yeah? It, that is relatively, but this also depends on the types of uh, uh, sense, uh, sense sensor. If it's going to uh, expose to this, uh, bacteria or live viruses. So therefore they will need special sort of uh, ethics approval and mm -hmm. also um, health and safety and also a lot of, uh, require a lot of funding to support mm -hmm. it. So therefore, um, and also expertise because you were, for example, in our case, we could have bring in microbiologists um, is a multidisciplinary because they know um, that feel very well. So therefore we need to also bridge the gap um, so as what Professor Fabian mentioned, you know, you've got to have the same terminology. So you mm -hmm. find that, you know, and you've got to get everyone to tune in to, you know, think in along that, that, that kind of a perspective. So for microbiologists to think in terms of material science and engineering and vice versa for us to appreciate their context. And all this will take time. It will not happen overnight. And you find that, you know, um, it will come to an optimum uh, period where this kind of a mutual sort of understanding develop. And for me is that um, this will take a, a good couple of years uh, in order to, to really uh, come to have a good uh, grasp of the both uh, different field or even wider field. And yep. also currently we look into also explore that like the patient test, clinical testing, and therefore the, all the terminology that they use and then we got to familiar with quite rapidly and uh, and also to try to work together when we try to put in the joint grant applications so you find that each party can write their work packages very well but then you find that you need to make something that flow you can see the interaction and integration and that also is a challenge because of uh, each field they are so um they have their own uh, speciality so to break the barrier that is not something simple yeah. and and, and you, we, I got to learn microbiologists, you know, get some textbook to read, not, don't need to read up to very detail, but to a certain extent that will enable me to communicate with Absolutely. them and vice versa. Yeah, and, no, that's brilliant. I mean, you, you summed it up very well. It, it is about making sure we can speak a common language and people think science is a common language, but it isn't. I mean, we've, when we did our little, we did a little bit of work on SARS-CoV-2 and we went to an expert because I wouldn't know one end of a virus from another one, you know, yes. it, it, it actually, uh, yeah, so I had to go to an expert. But what I'm going to do now is take a few questions from the audience, Funny. 
Yeah, the audience have some questions for our panelists. Yes, Ijeoma, we've got two questions for the panelists. One is um, about how do the panelists support their students to generate ideas and use transformational research to make a global difference that trickles down to an individual level? The second question is for Bayo. How does MTN dedicate very specialized teams to contribute to grand challenges? Does the government finance these projects putting corporations and academics together? <laughs> I, I could, I could say I'm shaking my head for bio, but first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, thank you very much, Fully. I'm going to go to you, Ike, because your research has had a major impact on patients, pediatric patients. And the question was, how do you support your students to generate ideas? And how do you also make sure that their research will have an impact? You've done it. Tell us how you did it. All right. Thank you, Joma. Uh, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, what we do here, you know, is to uh, steer their interest. Uh, the students we usually work with here are the postgraduate students, the resident doctors. And the way we've done this is to uh, get them involved, uh, steer their interest, and get them to pick up the skill. You know, for the work on stroke prevention, uh, it starts with being able to do the TCD, which is a transcranial Doppler. So they have to get the skills, know how to do this so they can identify the children who have a risk of stroke. And then we, we then go on the next step, trying hydroxyurea on them. So uh, we've been able to do that in getting their interest and then um, supporting them with funding, you know, because it's expensive. So you make the machine available, you make the resources available, the laboratory support available. And uh, I think that's really, that, that, that has worked for us. And, and, and the question really was, how do you get them to generate ideas? Do you have any brainstorming sessions? How do you get them to yeah. think of something new? Yeah, you know, uh, they, they go on their own and search. And then we have brainstorming sessions. We have regular research meetings, you know, uh, which we hold fortnightly uh, with, the, with my mentees and our research group. And then they come with different, you know, I want to work around sickle cell disease. I want to see how to make this better. Uh, currently, I have one working on looking at the relationship between hemoglobin F and the, and the transcranial Doppler velocity so that if you're in areas where you don't have access to the TCD machines, you probably would have the option of hemoglobin F. And we're trying to see if uh, this translates, you know, high velocities has any relation with the hemoglobin F. Yeah. So brainstorming session, and then they come up with their ideas, one page proposal, and then we see how uh, well this would work and uh, if it will have the desired impact and if it's doable, uh, within the constraints in our system. Thank you so much. Go to you, Bayer, and, and ask you whether the government funds your research. And I, I think it would be a one-word answer. I'll, I'll just uh, go to Delmira first and ask about how do you get people to generate uh, ideas well, in your we, lab? I don't know if, well, the, the one thing I wanted to mention before is uh, the challenges, and, and that comes to the answer, is that the, the funding models are very, as we were saying, of uh, safari research-like. So somebody goes to the place, and introduce somebody and that person gets out. So as you can see on all these panels, we are in the place with the partner and the partner is with us here and the other side. So I think that's very important. And unfortunately, the funding models do not support interdisciplinary careers. I, am, I have been lucky because I sit here with three hats, being a clinician, a basic molecular scientist, and a computer scientist by training and research. So I can actually sit in a table and talk to many people. So coming to that is because I was lucky to that funding model for many parties of that area. It's like having to do a small orchestra with very different players. So I don't play any specific instrument, but I understand it. So that is difficult with the current funding. Of course, I my experience is to learn from different publication models. For example, the physicists are very good at publishing in alphabetical order. So you need to learn the language, not only that, but the funding models, et cetera. And I think the ideas depend on that uh, that everybody's saying, Fabiana was saying is, how do you learn the other's language? At the moment, in my team, I am basically the translator. So everybody new comes in, I have to synchronize with the orchestra. How do I get, and when you do that, ideas flourish. This is natural. 
And I found very worrying that we're doing this online because that doesn't happen online. It, it is possible, but it's challenging. Thank you very much, Delmira. Um, yeah, as you've said, I don't think you were lucky. I think you were just brilliant, Delmira. Let's stop saying how lucky we are and talk about how brilliant we are. Well, I was lucky I got the right partners at the right time and wonderful people in Nigeria accepted me to work there. Okay, good. And I, I, I don't think it's luck. So, so Bayo, uh, the question to you, and I, I'm waiting for you to surprise us. I mean, is the federal government of Nigeria funding your research? Who knows? Well, we're, we're, as you are aware, we're, we're a private business and we do have corporate social responsibility. So all these efforts are, are actually through our foundation, MTN Foundation, which is a reflection of our commitment as a business to give back to society uh, in a very holistic manner. Uh, prior to now, our approach has always been build hospitals, uh, give scholarship and all that. And uh, we have just moved to the next layer for us that we're not going to be very involved, not just in the final outcome, but in creation and exploring problems and in solving problems. And that's why we have to set up a unit around innovation. How can we work with the university community? And that led us to actually start a unit program called Academic Research and Develop Innovation Challenge, which is an approach where we look for researchers in universities that want to do high impact research, and then we partner with them. So as of today, we are 100% funded by MTN Nigeria. Of course, we are very open to government funding, international funding, so that we can scale up and make the impact sustainable. Thank you. Brilliant. I, 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 I to that, the, the platform allows us to have from academic funding to contribute because by you, we have done it with Vivadan, so in which some academic par funding partner with the private funding, the private partner to move Thank that. You. Brilliant. So um, I'm going to come to you now uh, um, and Soji and, and, and later to you, Patty. And, and really, you know, you work together brilliantly. There was a question of how did you find each other and 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 also partnerships and, and any challenges you might have had, Soji, even when it comes to selling the idea in the hospital to your fellow surgeons, who, of course, are not prima donnas, as we know. As a matter of fact, you've taken the words out of my mouth because that was the challenge to convince colleagues that we need this. But let me talk about how I met this wonderful personality called Patty. Um, so Patty, I think, has been working with um, Professor Shadi Ogunshola, who is the acting vice chancellor of University of Lagos. And they've been doing some work together. And then they wanted to develop this app. And then um, Professor Musha Hishola said, I have, this, uh, I have a boy um, who will link you up with surgeons. And then she discussed with me. And then when Patty visited Nigeria, I just saw a wonderful personality that we could not resist working with. So that's how we met. Um, the, 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 the questions that Patty and Tim were asked is, how did you together? to work with you because they believe that we are all in the theater, always busy, et cetera, which is true. But like I said, one of the thumbs up to the partnership was that we were involved in the, from the beginning. And um, the second challenge was um, convincing my colleagues. So the issue is um, we, know, we know all about antimicrobial resistance, but the truth is, are you actually um, complying with guidelines. There are, there are guidelines, the WHO guidelines, the NICE guidelines, it's, there are several of them. Are you, is there anyone? And it was when we were doing this that we found out that we are using in the hospital. And so this, this um, then was the platform I used to say, look, let's use this to have a reason, to have a uniform practice so that we are, whether you are in neurosurgery or you are in pediatric surgery, you're doing exactly the same time. I was able to convince them and they, they were able to attend our meetings, the interview session, the focus group discussion, and um, hola, the, the Gata app came up. Brilliant, uh, um, Soji. I mean, it, your powers of persuasion are, must be amazing. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. I like the way you turned it around and made it a benefit to the hospital. That's key. Patty, tell us, how did you manage to recruit all these brilliant surgeons onto your app? Thank you so much, Sergio, because you also have taken the words out of my mouth. So it did start with uh, Professor Shad Ogunjola, my long-term collaborator, and at the moment, the chairwoman of the Infection Control Africa Network. I have worked with through my uh, INRIC project for about a decade. 
And when we got this funding for the work in Nigeria, and we discussed, hang on, we want to get surgeons to use this gamified app. And we know how busy surgeons are and how difficult it might be for them to find additional time to work with us throughout the project to co-develop and co-author the app to make sure it's their own baby and they have the buy-in and then evaluate it for six months on top of their work. We thought, wow, what a challenge. But Shada, you know, took the initiative and said, well, I'll introduce you to the key people. Once you get the key people on board and they will get enthusiastic and see the benefit of it, they will recruit everyone else. They will be your champions. And as you can see, one of our prime champions was Soji. So thank you so much, so Soji, for being, you know, involved from the very beginning on top of all the busy work you do in a surgical theater operating on children to contribute, not just your ideas and your clinical input, but also getting so many people in the hospital on board. It was, I was impressed when I came to Lagos for the focus groups last year to see how many people phone time to leave the, their patients and their surgeries and join us for those instrumental debates, which made the app such a good product it is now. Brilliant, Patty, that's really good. And, and we, we're, we've got some press, I think, around the app because it's because it's won awards, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Funny, can you give me a couple more questions from the audience before we wrap up this session? Yes, Ijeoma, we've got two questions from the, audience, from the audience. One is, what does a great trans translational partnership look like? Should your views, experiences, resources be similar or do differences create opportunities for change? The second question is, how will you be using Netflix and Hollywood community to make sure data is shared? Well, uh, so f the first one is uh, going to go to Fabiana. Um, if you can, if you can read the question one again before we go, we we'll go to you, um, Mutale, for the Hollywood one. But um, Fabiana, what's the question again, Funny? First question. The first question is: What does a great translational partnership oh, okay. partnership look like? Okay, we seem to have lost Fabiana, I think. So I'm going to ask you, Quang Leong. To take that question, what does a great partnership look like? You're on mute. Okay, so the great partnership, or so-called the ideal partnership, okay, in okay, in my opinion, okay, maybe different people might think a little bit differently, and uh, I think is that um, everyone is singing on the same ham sheet, and um, they uh, will put in the um, contribution and uh, pulling uh, resources and uh, having the same goal and aspiration and the, um, to try to um, work closely together to create the desired impact. And I find that uh, this is just, uh, this partnership will take time to nurture, will take time, effort, just like the way we perform to carry out research to find the right partner they would think a lot, they have the right chemistry, very important. And we'll also have the, um, and they are complementary. And I find that the partnership will work best, you know, rather than uh, if they have a complementary expertise. So therefore they can really contribute. They don't feel like a threat, a competition, but it will be, uh, you know, that where we there's the need of each other, the symbiosis, I think that will be perfect. And um, okay. yeah. Brilliant. Um, and so in your view, is it personal chemistry or complementary expertise? Which one comes first? Um, I think, uh, good question. I think complementary will come first. Okay. Again, okay, complementary followed by the personal chemistry. And that, you know, that click, uh, uh, you know, just like, you know, uh, any partnership in relationship or in work, and in this kind of a technology partnership, they are all similar. You okay. need to find someone that you know you feel that you feel comfortable with, that you like to work with, that you enjoy working because this this is going to be in order to be fruitful. This is going to be a long term partnership. So therefore, you must enjoy each other company. So yeah. sometimes go beyond the work. You know, you, you have that kind of a, uh, also the kind of social interaction that you know that you feel warm to. Yeah. That you would like 
you really, you know, eagerly, you wake up first thing in the morning, you know, you think of this partnership, you know, rather than, oh, is there another next thing to do list? You know? <laughs> so in your, in your view, you need both. Thank you very much, Kwang Young. Vitaly, yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit about using data with Netflix and Hollywood. So I'm actually going to expand it outside of Netflix and Hollywood, even though those are two great levers. But what we're actually doing is using the power of narrative to translate complex research, right? People are not reading 40 page papers of methodology to find out how these technologies are impacting their lives. So I'll give three quick case studies that can really speak to drive home the point I'm making. So for example, here in the US, when we were thinking about facial recognition, one of um, our most uh, charismatic uh, Congress people had watched Black Mirror. And so in discussing the privacy implications of living in a surveillance state, we had we ended up with this great media bite where our congressperson was basically saying we don't want to end up in a black mirror situation we want to think about comprehensive privacy legislation in public space and using Black Mirror as kind of a stand-in for the research that had been done um, around, this was in the case of uh, race and recognition technology for facial recognition, that was really powerful. And then another partnership here in the US has just kicked off with um, the Sussexes, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have recently with Time 100 been doing a lot of work where they're leveraging the information in the Netflix movie Social Dilemma, which speaks to the, the attention economy. And so, you know, film is one medium. We, uh, we're also working on an artist takeover of Times Square, which has obviously the iconic billboards, and that will be a health campaign, as well as anything that can capture the public attention generate press and get into the public subconscious the way that technologies actually impact us. Mm. And because obviously we are a nonprofit, we're interested in, in pro-social messages. So we didn't know that we would be involved in health disinformation, for example, this year, but it kind of, it popped up in the, yeah. in the, in the context that we're in. And we want to continue to embed pro-social messages. I'm obviously sitting here in the States, but grew up in the UK. And I always tell them about me watching Grange Hill as a child growing up and messages around smoking, which were public health messages were embedded into those scripts. I never mm -hmm. smoked. Yeah. I never took drugs. And it was because I had this understanding of what started as a research, but then was translated into storytelling. Brilliant. I, I love it. So, so really, it's, it's, a, it's a way to get the message out. That's the key thing, isn't it? So let's have a look at the responses to some of the questions we posed. The first question was, how easy is it to get um, to work across disciplines and across borders? The audience thinks it's not really easy at all. It is quite difficult. It's brilliant that you, you, the panelists have actually shown how they can, you can overcome these challenges. So that's, that's great. And use one word to describe research problems that still require cross-border cross partnerships. So we, we asked the audience to use one word and, and, and they said, you know, it's visas and funding. Um, yeah, I, I still uh, understanding impactful population sciences. Um, so quite quite a lot there, but use one word to describe the research problems that still require cross-border partnerships. Mm, the answers are interesting. Uh, and then the last one was, do you think that remote working will make it easier to do translational research, to find translational partners? And, and people think it will make it easier to find translational partners. Now that is very interesting. I would have predicted something completely different. Um, brilliant. So that we're now we're gonna move on to the next theme. And the next theme is all about the money. For us to do impactful research, we need money. If the federal government of Nigeria is not funding our research and we're lucky to have a nonprofit foundation, that's great. If we also are able to get funding from our research councils, that's brilliant. But funding is important. So the question to the audience first is, have you identified funding sources for cross-border partnerships? 
It's a simple yes or no. And I'm gonna now go to our panelists and ask them about funding sources that they use. So I'm gonna first go to you, Fabiana, and I asked you when you were developing your census, what was your funding source, Fabiana? Where did you get the money from to do this great work? Okay, thanks. This, uh, this question is not, not so good, especially for research in Italy, because uh, to be honest, we have not uh, enough, enough funding for the, the, the research. Now I'm working on um, three projects funded. The first one is funded by our Ministry of, uh, um, uh, of Defense regarding of uh, sensor. Um, the name of this project is Patch Stress, it means a wearable sensor to evaluate the stress of the, the soldier. So it's a wearable uh, uh, sensor field. The another is a bilateral project uh, in which uh, there is a um, development of a sensor to evaluate the, um, the concrete structure uh, health, okay? And another project is uh, with Professor Cho, is a collaboration project in which we develop, uh, we can, would like to explore the nanomaterial developed by a group of Cho with our expertise on, on sensor of Torbergata. And uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in March, in the, this pandemic event, uh, our uh, Ministry of, uh, of um, University uh, launched a call for development of uh, some useful uh, um, device for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, say yes, that two months or not more for the uh, feedback of this call, but at this time, I have not uh, any, any feedback about this, uh, this proposal applied. Reason for that, for example, for the development of the device that we have developed for the SARS-CoV-2 in saliva, we use our <laughs> personal funding. So <laughs> taking from salary and something like that, we merge uh, also a company, uh, so private, private funding because uh, in some cases like this, uh, the time is fundamental. Yeah. If you wait uh, so much time, uh, we can develop the sensor, but it's not, not uh, uh, more useful for the community. Yeah. So, so, so I would like to push uh, in general, uh, the evaluation to be fast in order to have a, a fast feedback uh, and also the funding to develop a system that is useful in the right time. Yeah, so, so yes, my point of view. Huh? Yeah, Fabiana, so you're saying that you made an application in March. They told you it will take two months to evaluate, but you haven't heard back. Amazing. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, big issue is, I mean, it I've, really happen. Yeah, I've had funding from the UKRI. And for you to get that funding, you have to be in the top 10% of all the applications. So you've got 90% of people that write grants including me when my grants don't work out. And we're just writing these grants and getting nowhere. It's a huge waste of everybody's time. It'd be great to have a different system, yeah. maybe a triage system, yeah. which allows people to sort of, you know, put in their stuff in a triage and then a few of us then write the real, real grant applications. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah for the, for the uh, project for via commission, for example, it's perfect. They, everything in time. The deadline is in time, everything in time. In uh, Regarding in Italian, it's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. For example, another yeah. at first uh, uh, European project, but uh, using the funding of Italy, mm. for me, it's uh, really a disaster <laughs> because uh, after three years, not funding received, a lot of bureaucracy. And so also in this case, uh, I use my funding because wow. sometimes they have the, uh, have the deadline to respect with other projects, uh, other partners. So sometimes really in Italy, it's not so easy to take funding, especially when uh, I won the project, uh, take the funding is not so easy. Yeah, unbelievable. That's, that's yeah, really yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, And Patty, tell us about, um, thank you very much, Fabiana. That was really insightful. Patty, tell us a little bit about the, how you obtain funding for, for your partnerships, you know, your, your app, where did that funding come from? 
Thank you, Ichioma. Well, I've been fortunate to work uh, in a developing world and the global south uh, for about a decade. So I have been lucky enough to develop really uh, equitable, cooperative, fruitful partnerships in Africa and South America, which are the two kind of focus continents. So when the GCRF uh, funding came about a few years ago, looking at establishing partnerships between UK universities and ODA countries in mainly global south and countries who are eligible for ODA funding, I felt I'm just hitting the ground running because I just leveraged my existing partnerships and went for a number of GCRF funds and was successful. So it was GCRF funding specifically dedicated to antimicrobial resistance from UKRI, which funded the Gazeta Initiative in Nigeria. Excellent. That's, that's really good. Um, and congratulations for that. Let me ask um, you, uh, um, uh, Bio, to tell us a little bit about, you, you must also have to carve out some time to devote to this research. And you, you've got the, your, your not-for-profit foundation, but you must have to have negotiations around the amount of time you spend on different tasks. And how does that work for you if, if you're able to divulge? Well, I, I think what has happened now is to now start putting together resources internally uh, to have dedicated team uh, who are responsible. In addition, we're also trying to resource some new, uh, uh, new roles that will position us to manage the relationship better. So we open ourselves up to bringing in young interns in artificial intelligence, data science, who can be like the, you know, they can be intermediary uh, between us and the community. In addition to that, from next year, we're going to be starting a program around bringing in academics to work with us, uh, three months, six months, one year, and become the intermediary so that they understand what we have and they can be able to broker the engagement uh, with the academic research community. Mm -hmm. So believe that we continue to learn, you know, th th there's no one size fits all. It's all adaptable, adjustable to context and situation. So we're being very experimental so that as much as possible, uh, we find a path to ensure that commitment to supporting the academic community is proven, is valid, is sustainable, and is scalable. Thank yes. you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. So you're, you're actually expanding, which is, which is fabulous. And, and this question is for you, Soji. How did you, I mean, you've got patients on the operating table you have to pay attention to. How did you carve out time to dedicate to this project? Oh, um, thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the simple thing was that usually before, the, before our meetings, um, we usually would have a small meeting between us and fix a time that's generally acceptable. So in the University of Lagos, Wednesdays is our research day. So there are no clinics on Wednesday. There are no theaters except for emergencies and probably day cases, which are usually light and done by trainees. Um, so most of our meetings are fixed on that day when most people would not be committed to clinical assignment. Um, and then um, subsequently we do other things in our own time um, separately. But just to talk about funding, I did not, I did not get funding for the, for the partnership, but I, I do know that there are um, funding opportunities also um, with the TET fund in Nigeria, that's the tertiary education fund up to, it, um, it's small compared to funding from NIH and all that. But it's something that people can, from, from our country, can still um, um, get some funding for um, up to £100,000 um, per, per cycle. So it, um, I just wanted to mention that in addition. Brilliant. I, 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 that's really helpful. And I'm just going to ask the audience to, to really test the panel and, and ask questions about funding. I mean, it looks as if most people that answer the question on funding have identified um, sources of cross-border funding, but you might want to find out, you know, how, what it's been like actually applying for these funds and 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 and, and actually managing the fund. So I'm going to ask you, Matale, uh, you're you're working, your 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 firm is a not-for-profit, but you still need to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so, where do you, if you're able to tell us, where do you get your funding from, and how easy is it? 
So we were really lucky in the sense that it was a funder that actually came to me and had looked at my body of work because I was working as a fellow um, attached to various universities and working on some of these ideas and publishing and said, we, will we, we think that this could be an organization and they gave me a seed fund. So that was the MacArthur Foundation, which uh, is global. And then, you know, once you had, I went to, um, I went to a retreat that they had with other people in a field that we're developing here in the US called public interest technology. So it's folks like me that are developing services, goods and products in the digital and technical space that are really optimized for the public goods. So just as MTN is a, is a business and their bottom line is profit, I'm also a business and my, my bottom line is good for society, but we do also make money. We do also profit because we have a, we have a, a, a dual model where when we, uh, so for example, if we were to produce a film and then sell that to Netflix, we would negotiate with our lawyers to make sure that some of that will come back into the organization so that we can have non-philanthropic funds. But then what's become really complicated, and I touched on it in the collaboration question, is value. So if I want to go to Nigeria, for example, as a site, knowing that they probably don't have the same type of access that I may have where there is a dedicated sector in the country that I'm in to develop out this field of you know, critiques around technology to make sure that Silicon Valley, quite frankly, doesn't kill us. That, it, that we, um, if, we, if we are working with a partner that isn't in that same type of political and, and economic situation, how are we thinking about values? So one of the things that I'm thinking through with some others, there are um, other people that are leading similar groups is time is value in-country expertise is value. Uh, I'm really interested, I, I have a partnership that's coming up in the UK, my first ever. That's value, making sure that my colleagues in the UK doing similar work can also benefit from, from some of the models that we're creating. And unfortunately, the legal world hasn't necessarily caught up to me. So when we're developing those MOUs, I'm trying to think of, no, it, they call it in kind, but I, I don't like that because it sounds like charity, but how to, uh, how to make sure that IP and any profits and anything that can, any value that's created is equitable. And I don't know whether part of the work that, on top of all the work we are doing, I don't know whether I should be thinking about having really deep discussions about what is the future of value, mm -hmm. given that the, the United States is gonna be saturated pretty soon and the largest markets are in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And it would be, in my opinion, a damn shame that a woman from Sub-Saharan Africa isn't able to partner with partners in Sub-Saharan Africa because of this other kind of um, funding monster, um, as I often call it. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. And, and how, to, how to put a value on something that doesn't res end up being a dollar sign. It's right. And I would argue time. I really appreciate your questions around time. Mm. And I tell my funders all the time, the most valuable resources we have are health and time. When mm. we die, it's over. And who are you then going to argue with about giving a dollar to? Absolutely. You're so right. Thank you very much, uh, Matai. That's really, really interesting. And Del Miro, tell us about your funding experience. You, you touched on it a little bit with the last question, but now is your chance to give the audience the gory details about funding. Okay, so that, that is a very good question about funding. So I haven't, I will be have not able to do what I have achieved with my partners in, in Sub-Saharan Africa if I were not to have the flexibility to have core funding for many years at, uh, from the Medical Research Council. And from that, I'm just going to come now to say that the major sources of funding which we have in the Western world for this is NIH US, uh, the UK arrive in the UK and all the entities associated with it and the European Union. Of those, I will say that 
those the funding models are not fit for purpose for partnerships, long-term partnerships. I was, because I was in a core funded, which I don't have a project ticking on me. I have the flexibility to have a large wide of disciplines together with different kinds of projects, not only malaria, but all the other projects you hear around. So that is, it has to be a significant change. The other change has to happen that if, and I'm talking about partnership. One thing is a partnership, one thing is a translation. For the translation, if there has to be industrial involvement, if you don't have industrial involvement, whether for profit or not for profit, you are out, okay? It's impossible to do this at the scale without we engaging with industrial. And I think COVID-19 have shown that very clearly. So if we take this opportunity to see COVID-19 how has highlighted how inappropriate is the classic academic funding from these t three biggest funders, uh, because they are the main funders of, of research and all that. I think the, 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 the thing we need to find new modules for this partnership. For example, uh, Patrick touches on the GCRFs. As me as her, we were ready to go and we work out, wow, perfect, it drums in. But the GCRF was the first opportunity in which I can put on the same equal level my partners in Nigeria. So they get costed at the same time. So it was a beautiful model because they get recognized. The problem with that was a new scheme and the council are still learning about, and they will, we will have the cliff edges of the ends of projects. There is no continuity. And these partnerships suffer for a lot of, a lot of energy has to go in as Patty knows, you know, you put a lot of energies is a synchronization, not only of time sums, et cetera. So funding model must change. How do we accept that change? I don't know, but it's very easy to talk about having the partnerships down the South. A lot of people do safari research. That's the, the, the majority of people. Um, we, uh, you know, that's what I say. I was lucky not to be in that situation. Uh, I am the only one from the UK in my team, basically. The other rest is from Nigeria. So brilliant. Yeah. So, so quite clearly what you're saying is that first of all, you need a funding mechanism that identifies the expertise of partners that may not live in the West. That's one thing. And the second thing is that you need private funding for the translational piece. And that's my experience as well. We had to spin out a company. We started off really with our savings and then built the company up with lots and lots of uh, collaborations before then we're able to to out license something to the NIH. We got some government funding as well, but you're, you're absolutely right. We needed, even the government funding in the UK has to be matched by private funding if it goes into a company. So you've got a big grant, you've got to find the match funding. And these were the things that we did to, to uh, spin out in our company. Absolutely right. I'm gonna ask the audience now, uh, ask for the audience's questions. Funny, I understand you've got a few questions for the audience, from the audience. Ijama, we've got three questions from the audience. Uh, they're all on funding. Um, how has the work you have undertaken acted as a catalyst to change, to change mindsets and approach to translational research? That's the first question. Second question is, what are the core issues, I guess, in terms of funding in um, artificial intelligence right now? The third question is, what funding is available from UCL for this sort of work? Okay, brilliant. So I'm going to um, go for the first question, and, and that's about the, how you, it's been a catalyst for change. I'm going to go to you, Ike, because I think the work that you described really shows how funding can, you know, if you had the right funding, it can be a catalyst for change. So first of all, tell us how you funded the work, and, we, and, and then a, a briefly about the, the changes. Right, uh, thanks, Ijoma. I actually, for the work on um, uh, stroke prevention, uh, I started actually with very little money uh, given by the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, you know, and uh, that was to build capacity for identifying those children who would need to have stroke prevention. So uh, get the skill, get the machine. And uh, that was the starting point. So that was really very useful, getting the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene uh, to uh, pay for my visit to the UK and to get the machine to have the skills transferred and then to provide you know, all the support. And then the next phase was trying out you know, the interventions, chronic transfusions. And a part of that had to be funded you know, with personal funds and with a few, a little support from uh, an ongoing project that we had at the time 
funded by the Wellcome Trust. So in Nigeria, it could actually be very challenging, you know, getting the the uh, uh, the support, and uh, you just have to be resilient, determined, you know. Uh, ready to make things work and then leverage, you know, on, on your collaboration. Uh, mm. But it, it's been a little easier with the uh, epilepsy uh, study. And Jamiro has touched on that. Uh, we were fortunate to get the GCRF fund and uh, that has uh, worked really well for us. I mean, we had the, he's the only foreign partner on the, on that collaboration project. No, I mean, not only him, uh, Jamiro and uh, Danny, and then the others are from uh, Africa. And then we have our uh, flexible funds that's allowed us to adapt the project. For example, on that particular uh, grant, we needed to have an EEG technologist. And you know, manpower here is an issue. So we had to find like middle level uh, manpower train. And then, but the fact that you have some flexibility with the funds and then some funds allocated you know, to uh, the Nigerian uh, site, actually made this a lot easier for us to achieve. Brilliant. And I'm going to, um, thanks very much, uh, Ike. That's, that's really, really clear. Um, and Quang Liang, I'm going to ask if you can address the question about funds that are available from UCL, because I know you, you, you won some funds for some partnerships. Yes, uh, and I find that the uh, UCL is really brilliant and we are really grateful for the global engagement funds that allow us to open up the opportunity uh, for collaborations that we would not have uh, envisaged in the past that uh, and also really facilitate these uh, wonderful collaborations. For example, uh, uh, we have this cl uh, close collaboration with the uh, WIT University in South Africa. So uh, working on how we can look into develop uh, low cost uh, 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 solar cells uh, that will be uh, you know applicable to the wider community, more affordable solar cells. So I know that this is a bit different from our healthcare dis uh, discussion, just to show that the you know th that really facilitate these whole ideas. And you know it's amazingly also for me to learn about my partner in Wits University. They are doing fantastic sort of research, okay, which is not quite often being. Uh, be aware of by the Western country. So they are fantastic, you know, very high level research. Uh, and, and also, of course, we have this through this global engagement that allow us uh, with one of my uh, colleague, Dr. Wang, maybe in the audience, you know, they try to identify this uh, particular core uh, that's a bit with uh, UCL and Rome. Then I said, you know, that's brilliant. And therefore, then we managed to identify um, uh, this uh, uh, Professor Fabiana and also the, um, uh, the colleagues uh, Mosconi and uh, they are also one of the world leading expert in in sensors and biosensors. Therefore, then uh, it just uh, is is wonderful. So we have visited each other. That that's brilliant. You know, of course, due to the COVID, this uh, interaction has been you know hind hindered to some extent uh, because uh, quite a lot of this partnership is good to have a face to face talk. I know yeah. that you know why are this uh, teams and Zoom they are wonderful but you need that kind of um you know the feel you know maybe the all the five senses to get involved uh, hopefully um um, we can do so in a better time. And also we have a collaborations like with PKU in Peking University. So it's mm -hmm. all over the world. And, and yes. through this interaction, it can like, us, uh, you know, it catalyze, you know, help us to think more globally, you know, how to see, to have a much wider sort of engagement and partnership uh, and also beyond the funding. So it's, uh, it's brilliant. And of course, on this, we also got this uh, wonderful sort of EU funding. So I've been quite uh, fortunate. We have a, uh, three uh, 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 quite a big European funding working mm. on uh, various sectors for different sort of uh, application translational research and um, however with this sort of a Brexit you know and uh, so therefore um, this things might be a, change, a good with, challenge yeah things will change with Brexit thanks very much Kang Leong I, I don't have time to take the AI question I might be able to take it in the next session but um, what I'd like to do is to, to, to look at what the audience's response has been to the question, have you identified funding sources for cross-border partnerships? And it's, it's a resounding yes, we have, which I think is brilliant. Um, and I really hope that those of you that put your applications in are, are more successful than, than some, of the, some of the things that I've done, which, which have been less successful. But um, let's move on now. And we're really going to look at the very last theme and that is, have we learned any lessons? Would we do things differently? 
Um, and I'm just trying to think about my translation experience, whether I do things differently. I think one of the things that I probably would do differently is when it comes to licensing out, I'm so keen to get a license. I do a little bit more research, a little bit more due diligence on the potential licensee. I think I would do that in the future, you know, um, just so that I have a better understanding of where the asset is going to go. That's one of the things that I would uh, do differently. So let me ask the audience now about this lessons learned. Tell us using one word, how you would do things differently. You've been through your partnership. You've learned a lot about having a partnership that is cross-border. You've learned a lot about the translational piece. How would you do things differently, knowing what you know now? That's the, that's the question to the audience. And panelists, these questions, when you respond to these questions, you have 60 seconds to tell me your answer because we're getting to the end. And, and at the end, Patty is gonna give us, you know, three minutes on, on, on your translational journey. So Patty, I might miss you out for this, this round if you don't mind, but let's go now. I'm gonna first go to Mutale because I didn't quite get, the, get to the AI question and you've been through it. What would you do differently knowing what you know now? I would have got an entertainment lawyer first. Good, I, I like that. So is again a due diligence response. Yeah. At Bio, this question's for you. You've, you. you've shared your data set with all these academics and you probably had to say no to some of them. What would you do differently knowing what you know now? I, I think we'll, we're going to be more forward-looking, um, you know, uh, to the extent that we start making the data even available before need. That is actually our new model, too, you know, because the more we fraternize with academic community, the more we know the kind of data they may need, such that we'll begin to configure the data in advance. Secondly, to start building what we call sandboxes, where they can work on, for example, those that I want to build application, uh, those that might need IoT, we want to go ahead and start building a test bench for those in advance. So that when anybody comes, it's uh, it's just ready. Just use it and have it really? you know, proactively. So you're preparing for even more clients. More exactly. Clients. <laughs> for impacts. Good. Delmiro, you've been on this journey a long time. Maybe not as long as I have. I think I'm older than you. But tell me, <laughs> what would you do differently? No, you know now. I, the only thing I think I will do different is to get less preoccupied with the issues of impact factors, journals, metrics, and try to use that time because publications go out anyway, and sign, good sciences speak whenever you publish in in, in any journal, and. I will focus more the engagement with the industrial partners because I, that, that will be critical for the translation and the impact through distribution of a product. Yeah, so great. So you're going to start talking to more downstream partners so that you yes. get more impact. Yes. I think that's brilliant. And it's not only money what you need, is the conduit. Sometimes the partner like MTN is brings a conduit, for example, in some of our work, for example, hearing aids and other of those projects is not about the money, it's about the penetration into the population, for example. Absolutely. So Ike, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Tell me. Yeah, I think for me, you know, because funding is a major issue in Africa and Nigeria. Uh, so what I'll do differently will be to grab every opportunity that comes my way with both hands, you know, and not mind the rigors of seeking for funds for translational research because I know that results are always gratifying. So I won't wait till the, the opportunities come and um, I'll go, go seeking. And when I find them, I will do all I can to ensure, to ensure that I'm in the top 10% to get my work from there. I, I, I love that. So you're, you're just, you're, you're just going to be more avid when it comes to seeking out and grabbing these opportunities and caring for your patients and teaching your students and maybe having a family life. Hey, but anyway, you're going to do them all. And now I'm going to ask you, uh, Fabiana, you, I just hope you're not going to say you're going to use your personal funds next time. Tell me what you'll do differently. 
uh, I, I started to work with the company uh, since two or three years ago. And if, and uh, like so much this because sometimes uh, I see that uh, the what I develop in the in the lab can move in the in the market or start to market entry. So mm. uh, and uh, also for this reason I started to apply as um, said before uh, Professor Choi before patent and after publication. If I come back, uh, probably this is the line uh, before patent uh, for the good uh, uh, sensor available suitable for market entry and after uh, um, a publication. Yeah, so you, you're going to get your patent in sorted out so that you can commercialize. Yeah, that's brilliant. Quang Leong, tell us what you do differently. Thanks, Fabiana. Sure. Um, we also have a, a lot of industrial sort of engagement and uh, also a licensing uh, for the exploitation and uh, translation um, so for our, of our research. And uh, just would like to share with you, you know, just like what Ijo mentioned, it's very important. You've got to perform due diligence on your partner, industrial partner. We, from our experience, we have this, uh, you know, don't accept the first check that's written to you, you know, literally, you know, um, that will put your technology onto the shelf because, you know, they just want to protect your interest because your technology could be very destructive and they may have in, in invested sort of 100 million in, in their in their existing technology and therefore um, they will just give you a little nice check that you think is wonderful but they will take your technology and put it in the shelf and you don't see the daylight out of it and you find that you know at the end is okay making money is nice but it's not the main purpose it's really making a difference but you find that your technology will not be able to talk about it, discuss about it because of all this legal, legal rank, wrangling. So another thing is that get a good patent lawyer. Yeah, that is really important, you know. And uh, do the due diligence and make sure also got to bring in expertise that know the economical landscape that potential impact. Because we as an academics, you know, we think quite differently. Uh -huh. You know, we just think of very ethically, but for them at the end is business. Yes, you're it's absolutely a different right. mindset. So one got to, you know, and you find that it's not our world. We operate in a very different world. We think of honesty, integrity, ethics, and all this. For them, anything that you think of all these things, loophole, at the end is business. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kran Young. You, the, the, the due diligence on the partner is key. Soji, I'm asking you, you know, you've, you've got this into the hospital, you've got all the surgeons inside. If you had to do it again, would you do it differently? Oh, certainly. And I will, rather than aim for the sky, I will aim for the moon. And Ooh. this is what I mean. Uh, this is what I mean. Um, since we started this, we've been engaging our, our colleagues, the anesthetists, the intensivists, as well as the pediatricians where our patients are. And we now begin to question why, how, how are they using the antibiotics? So if I'm to do it differently, I will include the pediatricians, I will include physicians, and I will include intensivists to be able to use the app so that each time they use the app, they are absolutely sure why they should use antibiotics. Thank Brilliant. You. Thank you so much. And, and, and that ends theme four. And now we're going to move over to the summary. And so what I've asked um, Patty to do for the benefit of the audience is, is really to, to describe the translational journey in just 120 seconds. But before that, let's have a look at the audience's response to the question. Use one word to describe how you would do things differently, knowing what you know now. And they've said, trust, due diligence, hear the voices of the poor, speak clearly to each other, have the passion. I think we've got passion in spades. If we have any more passion, we'd take off. All of us would just be floating around in the atmosphere. But I understand you really need to have an action-based approach. Brilliant. So Patty, I'm gonna hand over to you and to tell us about your journey in 120 seconds. Thank you so much, Ijeoma, for giving me the opportunity to wrap up this session and share my translation research journey. And in fact, it's been amazing to be on this panel because we have similar experiences, all of us who shared what we have achieved in the projects we have been leading. I think starting with the passion, and yes, we have passion in spade. We want to change the world. 
we can't just start with thinking this is a book seeking exercise of academic research we finish with a publication so wanting to change the world wanting to go beyond the ivory tower and making a change in the real world even though it is not necessarily much appreciated by the standard academic evaluation i think is the start of the journey and the partnerships this is the key finding a passionate, enthusiastic partners in Global South and develop really warm, equitable co-authorship partnerships where there is a strong buy-in from the very beginning. I love the um, idea of Del Miro saying we are like an orchestra because in my non-academic life, I'm in fact an opera singer. So I'm not the prima donna because I'm not as good to be as soprano leader. But actually, the idea of us feeling like a different instruments and different voices in the orchestra is exactly how we should confront and embrace a joint collaborative research across countries, continents, barriers, and disciplines. Without this feeling of a music making together, where each part plays its important role, we're never going to achieve anything translatable and impactful in the real world. And to summarize, I think my journey from this enthusiastic UCL-based researcher actually led to massive admiration for people like Soji in Nigeria, who I visited and I saw the conditions they have to work in, conditions we cannot imagine in the Western world, in the NHS. We take for granted that power never goes off in a hospital. It does. It does in Nigeria on a regular basis because they have power shedding. So these are the conditions people are working on and they're so committed and dedicated to treating their patients and still they're equally committed to developing the next generation's innovations and product like our Gazda app. So I'm really grateful and feel humble for being privileged to work with people in Nigeria and in other parts of Africa and South America and other projects who really made me appreciative and humble to be part of making a change to the world. Thank you so much, Patty. I mean, you couldn't have put it better. So I'm just going to summarize what we've learned from today. So what we've learned is that we've got brilliant researchers, as Patty said, dedicated to wanting to make a difference. They've got great research ideas, but that's not enough. They want to get them into the field. So we've heard about people working with artificial intelligence and understanding how it could dis discriminate against certain communities and deciding that that is not acceptable. And deciding to work with Amnesty International and with, with um, other media organizations to make sure that people do not feel disenfranchised. We've heard about sensors being developed with very, very low footprints so that they can be used in resource poor areas and have a sustainability um, niche entered into them. We've also heard about this gamified app, which allowed the hospital to look at its antibiotic use and reduce its antibiotic use for the good of everyone. We've heard about using computational tools to better diagnose epilepsy in resource poor settings. And we've heard about using um, computational tools to understand exactly how you can diagnose malaria better. A lot of this sensor work has, has gone on to be patented and is looking to be, to be used in the community. And of course, we've heard about NTN with all the data on mobile phones, the biggest and most impactful mobile phone company on the continent has decided they're going to use the data for the common good as a way of giving back to the society. I think what you see here are very committed individuals that want to make a difference. But we've heard about the challenges, some of the challenges associated with getting funding from the right places, the difficulty of getting funding, having funding removed due to bureaucracy, crazy absolutely crazy, but people willing to use their own personal funds to make a difference. And if you would do something differently, what would you do now? I was surprised to hear you're going to get lawyers involved, but that's what people want. And well, as, as, as good as it is, a, a whole new thing about making sure you do your due diligence so your technology isn't put in a drawer. We heard about that. 
So what I'm gonna do now is ask the audience to answer two questions before I thank my panel. How have you found this session? And so you're going to have a series of prompts. Please, as many of you as possible, please try and answer this question. Tell us what you thought about this session nine. Give us your responses. That's question one. And the second question is to use one word to describe how um, we can improve future events. That's the second question. So you have two questions from the audience to answer. And as you're answering that, those questions, I'm gonna go around the panel and ask the panel to use one word to describe the learning you've had from this session. And I'm gonna to go to you first, Mattel. One word to describe the learning. Amazing work taking place across Africa. Loads of words, woo, but I'll take amazing. I'm gonna ask you, Adesoji, one word to describe the learning from this experience. Exciting. Wonderful. Delmiro, one word to describe what you've learned from this panel. Enabling. Excellent. Ike, one word to describe what you've learned. Superb. Oh, love. Superb work. Sorry? Superb work around oh. the world. Wonderful. Bio, give me that one word. Inspiring. Excellent. Thank you. Patty, one word to describe your learning. Orchestra. Oh, that's a lovely one. Playing the orchestra. Quang Leong, one word. Enriching. Oh, lovely. That's cool. Fabiana, do you have a single word to describe your learning? Very good. <laughs> Two words. <laughs> so all it, it remains for me to thank you. We're one minute over. Thank you very much, Professor Patty Kostova. Thank you, Professor Delmira fernandez Reyes. Thank you very much to Olubaya Adekombi. Thanks very much, Professor Kwang Leong. Thanks very much, Professor Fabiana Arjuni. Thank you very much, Matela Umkonde, for staying up in the middle of the night. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for Professor Ike Olua Lagunju. And thank you so much, for Professor Adesoji Amuyua, Ademuyua. And uh, thanks for spending time, which you could have spent with your patients. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to the audience. Goodbye. And we should thank you as well, Ijoma, for your excellent so leadership and organizing yeah. this uh, enriching event. Inspiring. And love this. Thank you. Thank you. Much thanks to you, Ijoma. Thank and to party thank for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.